Today I'm going to talk about urban processes and how the processes um, in an urban environment actually change over time and the way that the people interact with that urban space also change over time. The first uh, process I'm going to talk about is called agglomeration. If I have any settlement to exist, we need agglomeration. So this is where people and economic activity concentrate in certain favourable locations. So historically, the first kind of places that people would have um, concentrated might be because of protecting themselves. So um, first kind of cities and towns might have existed in high ground because they can see all your enemies. So you would um, base your towns and cities there. It also might be in favourable locations such as crossing points on rivers. So that means you know how to get across that river easily. When these first towns and cities were existing, these were important factors. Also, similarly, it might be close to resources. So an example of this is the place that we live near, Oxford. Oxford is on the River Thames. And the reason why Oxford first existed before the university was that it was um, a really favourable place for cattle to cross for the market. So Oxford comes from the word oxen, oxen and ford, fording a river. So this is the reason why Oxford first came into being many, many years ago. After we get agglomeration, cities uh, tend to expand um, and grow from that, that central core, which it started. And we call this process suburbanisation. As the city grows out from its core, the city and the buildings get less dense. So in the centre, all the buildings are really close together. And this would have been largely because when those cities and urban places were formed, transport would have been difficult. And so they would have to have had uh, people close together so they could interact and have economic activity. But suburbanisation is where, as it grows out, the the, the spaces between the buildings get bigger. And we can see that in our picture where the core is right in the centre in the far distance, the CBD we would call it. And the the housing that surrounded it that's grown out for it, lots more trees in there, so it is uh, less dense. So why do suburbs grow? So there are multiple reasons why they do grow. And as I said before, one of the first ones is improvements in transport. So People, as they get cars, can move out of the city and live outside the city because they can um, get into the city easily. So they can um, get in and out very easily and so they can decide to live further away from where they work. The next factor is, is kind of like a push factor. So overcrowding in the centres, congestion, often these places are high in demand and so lots of people want to live there which drives the price up and therefore going to live in a space where it's less crowded where there's less congestion um, like the suburbs is why people go so people go there because they're, they're sick of what it's like in the center and the suburbs offer more space as we said lower densities and there'll be lower prices than the center is as we said about rural and urban migration as a city grows more people and more businesses so we need more houses the only place you can put houses is in that place where we have space and that spouse space is outside of that core region and therefore more houses are built as a city grows the last one is similar to that kind of factor about overcrowding as that city gets older, those places in the middle often decline in their quality. So this, this housing right in the centre often is of poor, poor quality. And so these suburbs are built on the edge. They are newer. And so as they are newer, people are attracted to them. And so people want to go and live out there. There's demand and therefore we get suburbs growing. Here's an example of really quick urban growth this is in Dubai on the left in 2002 and only six years later we can see these areas here where suburbs have grown this is because of all those factors we've just discussed and even down here this area that was once desert is now full of suburbs if I showed you a picture of Dubai now we would see even more suburbs building on the edges of this um, this con conurbation
So after we get the growth of urban areas through suburbanisation, the next process is that people eventually decide not just to move to the suburbs, but actually out of the town and city and settle in smaller towns and rural areas around it. They're still connected to uh, that major urban place in a process that we call uh, commuting. So that is where people would move out and live somewhere else, but they would probably still work in that urban area and move back to that area regularly on a daily basis to go work there. So a good example of a, a place where there's lots of commuting is London. So London has grown as an urban area, but people have now moved out into these smaller settlements and Oxford and Didcot could be considered on that commuter belt um, outside London where people live there, but then they go and work in, in London. Largely prices would be cheaper to live in Didcot and so they could a uh, good train line to get into London and go work. A place like Didcot is a really good example of a dormitory settlement. That means, um, as you could get with the word dormitory, it's where people sleep, but they don't actually work. So people would work in London or places like Oxford, but they would go and live and sleep in, in Didcot. So that's what we call a dormitory settlement, and that's where people would um, commute from uh, to go to work. After commuting... Um, this is where, again, again, that process of people moving out of the city continues at a, a faster pace. And this is what's happening in a lot of developed countries. So as cities grow and the kind of urban problems you see in the push factors here, noise pollution, um, kind of lack of space, air pollution, higher crime rates and overcrowding. These all become things that push people out of the city in a process called counter urbanization, where they then go and move from urban areas to live in rural areas where you've got more space, beautiful scenery, lower crime rates, less pollution. So we get that process of people moving out of the city. An example of this is Radley Village where it's, it's a really nice place to live, the scenery is lovely. Um, people are moving here, so houses are being built here to meet that demand of counter urbanization. People that used to live in Oxford or, or Reading or maybe in London are moving out to the, um, to the countryside to get some of those benefits. However, this process can't go on forever. Um, and so lots of money is being invested in a process called urban regeneration. This is where we are trying to make these urban areas places that people want to stay. So to do this, we invest money into not only improving the physical structure, as you can see in these two buildings, where they've actually painted them again, made them look um, better from this one on the left, which is in the same neighbourhood, which is all derelict. But also you're helping to change the economy. So revive that old urban area. So maybe it's lost a lot of businesses and, and pump new money in it so new businesses can come into that. A really good example of this is on the left here is the London Docklands, which in the 50s was a derelict area, had gone through deindustrialization. where lots of the shipping uh, jobs had been lost. And over time, the um, government invested a lot of money into changing this place from uh, uh, the physical locations by knocking all the sheds down, getting rid of the industrial waste and actually creating uh, and new jobs in a completely different sector. So it's part of it is now converted into Canary Wharf, which is the centre of finance and business in London. It's a really important um, area. That is where money was invested, changes the physical lo location, but also changed the economy, changed the job type here. Part of that process of urban regeneration sometimes requires what we call urban re-imaging, urban rebranding. This is where not only do we change the physical environment, but we change how people perceive it. So a good example I'm going to show you is about Glasgow. This is where Glasgow had a certain image. And in this picture, you can probably guess what the image was in the 1930s. It's where the image was of a tough city. It was a place that had lots of derelict buildings, lots of crime rates, unemployment. It was a kind of a poor place, largely because big industries like shipping, shipbuilding, which it was famous for, had um, left the city. So in this 80s, they decided to give it a new image. And once you give it a new image, 
this image can be marketed to a whole new people. So this is what we call giving it another brand. So its brand of or its image of being a tough city was replaced with this new brand that Glasgow was a really friendly but arty place. So it was called Glasgow's Miles Better and they promoted and invested money into um, the art side and had um, Commonwealth Games there and festivals and culture and they were trying to give this new image of it as an arty cool place to go so that it could be uh, an attractive place for tourists who would bring their money and bring their investment into the city. So that was that combination of they approved the buildings and made built new art centres, but then they also changed the image. So they changed that people wanted to go there because they thought that it was a, a nice, arty, interesting place to go. Similarly, at a similar time, we've got this last process, which is happening roughly the same time as urban regeneration, and it's called the urbanisation of suburbs. So we know that suburbs are low density places generally. This is what's attractive for them, for people to move out to. But as these urban areas have more pressure on them and have more people, like kind of lack of space elsewhere, this is where those dense, low density suburbs are becoming more urban because we're seeing more development, more building happening in this area. Here we can see in the, in the diagram I've drawn, those trees that were there have disappeared and they've actually been replaced by flats, shops and services. The, the detached houses have gone and have been replaced by bigger buildings. Any vacant lots or any lots that had trees on them have been maybe replaced. This is that process where those low density areas are becoming more dense. And therefore, uh, this is what we call the urbanisation of suburbs.